you know, I know that a lot of you right now are dealing with a lot. This whole coronavirus thing was a massive, massive curveball to all of us. I've been telling people it feels like something out of a dystopian novel or some kind of crazy movie. It's hard to believe that this is really going on. The entire world. I just named off all these countries where people are joining us from. All of you right now would be quarantined in your homes. I mean, it, it, it appears that every country in the world is doing some sort of quarantine and the economy of the world has been impacted. And so I know that a lot of you right now are experiencing trials. For some of you, it's new. It's uh, something that you haven't experienced much of, maybe because you're a new Christian or maybe you just haven't gone through difficult times in life yet. Uh, others of you, you are trying to make sense of it all because maybe you're even watching us and you're not a believer. You know, I remember as a new Christian, I uh, experienced indescribable bliss in Christ. Uh, I had a crazy past, as some of you may have heard me allude to yesterday. Uh, I was a gang member before I came to Christ. Uh, I was young. I was still a teenager before I had even turned 16. But I was a gang member with the Crips, which here in the U.S., for those of you that are outside of the U.S., was one of the most notorious gangs around. And so at a young age, I got caught up in that. I was a hoodlum. I was a thief. Uh, kicked out of two high schools, tried to commit suicide in front of my family. Just totally, totally out there. So on August 15th, 1991, God reaches down his hand in the time and space, grabs a hold of the heart of this wretched sinner, opens my eyes to the truth of the gospel, and radically, and I mean friends, radically transformed my life, right? 2 Corinthians 5 talks about if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. And I'm telling you, my life was revolutionized. And, and it was bliss. I mean, I was really the perfect example, the paragon, if you would, of the blissful life. I was, I was the, the guy walking on water. I was a guy that was floating on the clouds. I was a guy that was glowing in the dark because my life was so transformed. And at that time, if you ask me, how are things going? Oh man, wonderful. I would have thought at that moment, the Christian life is all you know, just a bed of roses, uh, a, a bowl of cherries, a cakewalk. I mean, man, it was good. Really, really good. But of course, that day came when, like any good parent, after holding their baby in their arms for long enough, they know there comes a day when they have to put them on the ground and that, that child's going to have to start crawling and then walking. And, and as they crawl and walk, they're going to hurt themselves and they're going to stumble and, and fall and, and possibly get into some difficult uh, predicaments. And so that happened to me before long as a new Christian. And I started to realize, wow, this, this Christian life, it, it, it's not this bed of roses that I thought it was. Man, there are difficulties. As I had been just newly freed from all my sin, temptations weren't quite that intense those first couple of weeks. But boom, the, the you know, temptations kicked in. And then the persecution started kicking in. The friends that used to follow me and do everything that I did, you know, in the world weren't so keen on Christ. I thought they're all going to follow me and become Christians. But suddenly my friends started dropping off. Suddenly I, I started having people wanting to beat me up because I was preaching the gospel on my school campus. Suddenly I, I was beginning to experience uh, displeasure from people and, and get cutting remarks because of my faith in Christ. And then when I was 18, not long after I had been born again, here I was holding my own dear mother in my arms as I watched her turn into 80 pounds of skin and bones and take her last breath as she died of cancer. And there I was thinking, man, this, this Christian life is not this cakewalk that I thought that it was. And you know, a lot of people have that misconception. A lot of people have that, that idea that, hey, when Jesus said that he came to give life and life more abundantly, that meant that everything goes well. Maybe you, you've been around the health and wealth or the prosperity circles where a false gospel is preached, that, that Jesus comes to give you uh, life, peace, happiness. It's, it, you should be healthy. You should be wealthy. Uh, you should be blessed in everything that you do. Uh, maybe that's your perspective. And that's a damaging and a harmful one. And, and so maybe you find yourself in the midst of this whole coronavirus thing. You're thinking, man, well, what's going on? And, and why is this happening? And and a whole lot starts going on. Listen, I want you to listen to these words by J.I. Packer. He wrote a very well-known book called Knowing God. And there's a chapter in there that was a lifesaver for me at one point in my life as a Christian. And the chapter is called These Inward Trials. If you don't have that book, I strongly encourage you to get it. Uh, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. 
And the, the, the chapter is called These Inward Trials. And he speaks of those who give that misconception of what it means to be a Christian, saying that this, quote, he says, they play down the rougher side of the Christian life, the daily chastening, the endless war with sin and Satan, the periodic walk in darkness, as to give the impression that normal Christian living is a perfect bed of roses, a state of affairs in which everything in the garden is lovely all the time and problems no longer exist, or if they come, they have only to be taken to the throne of grace and they melt away at once. This is to suggest that the world, the flesh and the devil will give us no serious trouble once we are Christians, nor will our circumstances and personal relationships ever be a problem to us, nor will we ever be a problem to ourselves. And then he says, such suggestions are mischievous, however, because they are false. Wow, what a stinger right? Such suggestions are mischievous. Why? Because they're false. They're not true. It's not true that Christians don't go through difficult times. It's not true that Christians don't encounter unfavorable circumstances and challenging people and tough times and battle with the flesh and, and, and struggles with temptation. Listen, this is part and parcel of the Christian life. And, you know, expectations are really the foundation for disappointment or for survival. I was talking to a friend recently online who, who'd been going through some difficult struggles. And I said, look, if your perspective is that the Christian life is supposed to be some resort like Club Med, when in reality it's a war, yeah, you're going to be disappointed all the time. Right? I mean, imagine a soldier. Uh, they're told they have a mission, and for, for some reason, they think, oh, I'm going to go to some Club Med, and then they're thrown out into the heat of battle, but they're expecting Club Med. Of course, they're going to be disappointed, and they're going to be ill-prepared. Friends, listen. Christians right now, right now at this very moment, are being persecuted all around the world very, very intensively. Maybe some of you watching are in some of those countries where you're experiencing that persecution. It's not a joke. You know, I remember years ago being in Uganda speaking uh, in a refugee camp where the church where I pastored had done a work. We were ministering to Sudanese refugees that were fleeing from their countries because of persecution over their faith. And you know, some of the things that were done to some of these believers and to some Christians all around the world, they're cutting their lips off their faces. They're cutting their ears off of their heads. They're removing their noses. They are burning them and, 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 and cutting them up and torturing them and pl plucking out their eyeballs. This is happening to Christians all around the world right now. Listen to this. Open Door USA gave this statistic for 2020. They said 260 million Christians are experiencing high levels of persecution across 50 countries on the planet. Not just persecution, high levels of persecution. Now, we can have a debate over how many of those are legitimate Christians and if it's just, you know, a general persecution over them because they're persecuting Christians. Besides the point, those that profess Christ or who identify with Christianity are being persecuted in those numbers right now all around the world. And by the way, that is up 6% from 2019. 260 million. I hope we all haven't forgotten those, those men that were beheaded by those ISIS terrorists a few years ago. Friends, that's what's going on right now. Listen, 9,488 churches and Christian buildings have been attacked around the world in 2020 so far. And we're just in April. If current trends continue, Barrett, Johnson, and Crossing estimate that by 2025, an average of 210,000 Christians will be martyred annually. 210,000 Christians will be killed for the name of Jesus annually. That's not a joke. You know, more Christians have been murdered for Christ in modern days than in all the years of the entire church since, since its inception. That's what's happened in modern days. And the question that we're faced with, the question that you and I are faced with, whether 
we know Christians that have been persecuted, whether we have been per persecuted ourselves or whether we, we've gone through intensive trials, aside from persecution, just the difficulties and the struggles of life. The question that all of us face today is what are we going to do in terms of our walk with the Lord? What are we going to do in terms of facing life in a way that will cause us to be immovable, that will cause us to rise above it all and to pour our lives out for the glory of God, impacting the world around us, recognizing that eternity is coming and we cannot waste that precious time that God has given us. And so friends, for that, we wanna take a look at joy. And we're gonna to go to James chapter one, verses one through four. James says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I don't know about you, but there are certain passages in scripture that are absolutely mind-boggling and utterly perplexing to me. This is one of them. And, and this flies in the face of everything that I ever knew before I was a Christian. I mean, think about how you lived before you came to know Christ. And think of how foreign this notion would have been to you. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. I mean, who thinks like that in the world? Oh, things are going horribly. They're falling apart. I'm being treated unfairly. I'm being treated wrongly. I'm being hurt. I'm having all kinds of upheaval in my life. Oh, I'm going to count it all joy. I mean, you'd sound like a madman or a woman if you even voiced something like that to your friends in the world. But that's the call of the Christian. But, you know, we're oddballs anyway, aren't we, as believers? We don't quite fit in the paradigm of the world in terms of what's normal. I love what A.W. Tozer said about that. He said, a real Christian is an odd number anyway. He feels supreme love for one whom he has never seen, talks familiarly every day to someone he cannot see, expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another, empties himself in order to be full, admits he is wrong so he can be declared right, goes down in order to get up, is strongest when he is weakest, richest when he is poorest, and happiest when he feels the worst. He dies so he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passes knowledge. I love that. That's who we are as Christians. As my good friend Mark Spence always says, look, don't try to impress the people of the world with yourself because if you do, you're not going to impress them with Jesus. And stop trying to be cool because you're not. So give it up. We are different. But the question is, is are we living differently? We're going to look at the definition of joy in a moment. But, but I want us to to take a look at what James is saying in connection with it. First of all, James is writing to believers, as he says in the beginning of the book, to the 12 tribes that are dispersed abroad. He's addressing most likely the Christians that were dispersed after the martyrdom of Stephen. You remember in Acts 7, Stephen was martyred. And so in Acts 8, it says that a great persecution arose against the church and they were scattered all throughout, uh, out there into the regions of Judea and Samaria. So Christians were dispersed about. James is writing to them. They're going through persecution over their faith in Christ. And so when he says, consider it all joy and you encounter various trials, what's he talking about? So let me set it up for you. The word various, just so you get no misunderstanding, speaks of a variety or multiple categories. So it's, it's not just, you know, one trial here or there. He's talking about trials of every shape, of every size, of every form imaginable, right? Uh, just like it talks about in Hebrews, how Jesus was tempted in many forms as we are, in many ways as we are, yet without sin. And this, this has that idea with it, that these trials can be of every sort and every kind. Nothing should shock you. Nothing should surprise you. Nothing is beyond the scope of what you might go through as a Christian. And the testing that he's talking about here, the trial, is the word dogokoimian in the Greek. And it's the process by which silver and gold are refined by fire. He's not talking about kid gloves. He's not talking about such tools in your trial that are used against you 
as being tools that are soft, like maybe Q-tips or maybe cotton balls. He's talking about the chisel. He's talking about the hammer. He's talking about the saw. Tools that mold and that shape difficult tools. He's talking about the fire, the kind that's used to remove the dross from gold and from silver. And he says, we need to be those that have endurance in the midst of those multifarious types of trials of every sort and kind that are like fire coming against you. We are to have endurance, fortitude, staying power, heroic endurance. He's not mincing words. He's talking about not just passive survival. He's talking about this active pursuit of God in the midst of that fire that is trying you. That's what he's talking about. Why? So that you might be perfect and complete. And that carries with it the idea of maturity or completeness so that you might grow in the Lord. So what are we going to do? We're going to take a look at first the definition of joy, second, the demonstration of joy, and finally, the decree of joy. So what is this joy that James is talking about that applies to us right now? Those of us that are cloistered in our homes in the midst of this insane coronavirus. Some of you I know maybe have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost friends. Others of you maybe have battled it already or are battling it now. Others of you are wondering, what am I going to do about work? Because I just got laid off and I don't know how I'm going to take care of my family. I, I was already tight as it was. I've applied for unemployment. I don't know if that's going to come through. I, and, and you're just, you're, you're battling. You're at home. Tensions between you and your husband or you and your wife. Your kids are, are going crazy because they're overwhelmed about what's happening. They're at home. They don't know what to do. They're bored. I mean, so many trials. Maybe you're dealing with health issues. Maybe you're dealing with uh, personal uh, failure, that you're discouraged and disheartened over, whatever it is, listen, you need to understand what this joy is that James is talking about. First of all, know and understand that this joy that he's talking about is not a plastic smile. It's not a denial of pain or of sorrow and some kind of pretentious facade that you put on. It really falls more in line with <clears throat> what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Listen, he says, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. It's that paradoxical element that doesn't have to exist apart from sorrow that may be there as well. It's a kind of joy that can look at life and say, man, this is hard. This is painful. This is difficult. This is what it is. And in fact, <clears throat> your joy is increased even more when you have the right perspective. Because if you sugarcoat or if you dress up your difficult circumstances into being not so bad, then guess what? You can have a pretentious joy over things that aren't so bad. But if they are what they are and you call them what they are and you maintain joy in the midst of that, it's an even deeper and richer and greater and more satisfying joy. And it doesn't mean conditional happiness. It's not the kind of thing that is in keeping with, hey, I woke up today, everything was great. My skinny jeans didn't have a wrinkle in them. My latte that I got at Starbucks was, ooh, perfect. They blended that Frappuccino up just right. I mean, everybody loved me wherever I went. High fives, applause. I mean, chariots of fire playing in the background as the wind rushed through my hair. Come on, man. None of that. That's not what he's talking about when he's talking about joy. What is it then? The word joy here is the word kara in the Greek, and it carries with it the thought of delight and gladness. Delight and gladness. But, but how does that work? John MacArthur touches on that well. He says, biblical joy consists of the deep and abiding confidence that all is well, regardless of circumstance and difficulty. It is something very different from worldly happiness. Biblical joy is always related to God and belongs only to those in Christ. It is, listen, the permanent possession of every believer, not a whimsical delight that comes and goes as chance offers it opportunity. A good definition of joy is this. Listen, it's the flag that flies on the castle of the heart when the king is in residence. <laughs> oh, wow. Listen, for those of you in the UK or other countries that have monarchies, you understand what this means. I remember being in London outside of Buckingham Palace. I remember someone going, oh, the queen is home. <laughs> like, 
did, did she just text you or something? <laughs> they said, oh no, look, the, 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 the flag is flying. That means the queen is in residence. Friends, I love this. I mean, you have to understand, it's taking everything within me right now to not just like jump through this computer with, with exuberant joy because, because this is truth. Look, the world is full of lies. People are going on lies and lies destroy. Truth transforms and changes and, and revolutionizes the course of our life. Listen, get this. Joy is the flag that flies on the castle of the heart when the king is in residence. I am indwelt by the living God the God who spoke the universe into existence, the one whom heaven and the heaven of heavens can't contain, who spans the universe with his hand, the one before whom seraphim fly and cover their eyes and feet and cry, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, this is my God and he dwells in me. So no matter what I'm going through, I can maintain that joy. The king is in resonance and he'll never leave. Here's my definition that, that, that I wrote up of joy. Maybe this will be helpful to you. I define joy as an unconditional and sustaining sense of deep contentedness and gladness rooted in the knowledge of God's sovereignty, character, and love, and in the keen awareness of the blessedness we possess as his people. You get that? It's unconditional and, and it's sustaining and it's a deep sense of contentedness and gladness rooted in what? in the knowledge of God's sovereignty, character, and love. I know that God is sovereign. He has all power over all things, controls all things. I know that God is a God of, of uh, holiness and goodness and, 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 and uh, kindness. And then I know that my God loves me. And I know that I'm blessed. I'm saved from hell. I'm going to heaven. God has wiped my sins away. He's with me here now on earth. He'll cause all things to work together for good no matter what happens. And therefore, I'm sustained by that sense of contentedness, even when things around me are going crazy. And brothers and sisters, when we think that way, it affects our lives. I want you to listen to this uh, next point. Now, that's the definition of joy. Now, the demonstration of joy. This uh, thing that I want to read for you comes from a business book I read many years ago. And it talks about a man named Viktor Frankl, who was in a concentration camp. Listen to this account. Viktor Frankl was a determinist raised in the tradition of Freudian psychology, which postulates that whatever happens to you as a child shapes your character and personality and basically governs your whole life. The limits and parameters of your life are set and basically you can't do much about it. Frankl was also a psychiatrist and a Jew. He was imprisoned in the death camps of Nazi Germany where he experienced things that were so repugnant to our sense of decency that we shudder to even repeat them. His parents, his brother and his wife died in the camps or were sent to the gas ovens. Except for his sister, his entire family perished. Frankel himself suffered torture and innumerable indignities, never knowing from one moment to the next if his path would lead to the ovens or if he would be among the saved who would remove the bodies or shovel out the ashes of those so fated. One day, naked and alone in a small room, he began to become aware of what he later called the last of the human freedoms the freedom his Nazi captors could not take away. They could control his entire environment. They could do what they wanted to his body. But Viktor Frankl himself was a self-aware being who could look as an observer at his own, very own involvement. His basic identity was intact. He could decide within himself how all of this was going to affect him. Between what happened to him or the stimulus and his response to it was his freedom or power to choose that response. In the midst of his experiences, Frankel would project himself into different circumstances, such as lecturing to his students after his release from the death camps. He would describe himself in the classroom in his mind's eye and give his students the lessons he was learning during his very torture. Through a series of such disciplines, mental, emotional, and moral, principally using memory and imagination, he exercised his small embryonic freedom until it grew larger and larger, until he had more freedom than his Nazi captors. They had more liberty, more options to choose from in their environment, but he had more freedom, more internal power to exercise his options. He became an inspiration to those around him, even to some of the guards. He helped others find meaning in their suffering and dignity in their prison ex existence. In the midst of the most degrading circumstances imaginable, Frankel used the human endowment of self-awareness to discover a fundamental principle about the nature of man between stimulus and response, man has the freedom to choose. Wow. Now listen, friends, this is the point of all of this. 
Uh, I highly doubt Viktor uh, Frankl was a Christian. But the point is, if he, an unbeliever, can determine to think like that and end up having an impact like that and being impacted like that himself by that thinking, how much more can the Christian do that with the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us? That in the midst of our trials and difficulties and struggles, we can maintain that contentedness, that joy, regardless of the circumstance, because why? The king is in residence. Because why? Our sins have been wiped away. Because why? Our God will never leave us nor forsake us. Because he's, he'll cause all things to work together for good. Because as I've said already, we are going to heaven. I want you to listen to this account by Corrie Ten Boom. You guys know Corrie Ten Boom, of course. She and her family were sent to a concentration camp uh, in Holland because they had uh, rescued Jews who were about to be killed. And so they were ended up, uh, they ended up being caught and sent off. And she said this as they were in there, in the midst of all the torment and torture they went through. I mean, she describes it in detail in, in different places and it is just unimaginable. But listen to what she said. She said, when I was in the concentration camp, a camp where only 20% of the women came out alive, we tried to cheer each other up by saying, nothing could be any worse than today, but we would find the next day was even worse. During this time, a Bible verse that I had committed to memory gave me great hope and joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of God, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, evil is spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. I found myself saying, hallelujah, because I am suffering, Jesus is glorified. Wow. I mean, look at that. She's shouting hallelujah in the midst of a concentration camp, being tormented, tortured, starved, beaten. Hallelujah. Because I am suffering, Jesus is glorified. Do we say that in our trials? Do we, do we say, Lord, thank you. I'm suffering. I'm going through hard times. Hallelujah. Praise be to your name because you're being glorified through this, Lord. You say in your word that some suffer according to your will and that we should entrust ourselves to you as a faithful creator. God, I, I, I thank you that you're glorified. My life is yours. I belong to you. I should be consumed in the eternal flames of hell right now, and I'm not. Thank you, Lord. I rejoice in you. Wow. Look at that heart. Look at the heart of these girls who are in a situation uh, in communist China. I want you to listen to this. This is in 1966 to 1969. It says, the two Christian girls waited in the Chinese prison yard for the announced execution. A fellow prisoner who watched the scene from his prison cell described their faces as pale but beautiful beyond belief, infinitely sad but sweet. Humanly speaking, they were fearful, but they had decided to submit to death without renouncing their faith. Flanked by renegade guards, the executioner came with a revolver in his hand. It was their own pastor. He had been sentenced to die with the two girls, but as on many other occasions in church history, the persecutors worked on him, tempting him. They promised to release him if he would shoot the girls, and he accepted. The girls whispered to each other, then bowed respectfully before their pastor. One of them said, before you shoot us, we wish to thank you heartily for what you have, for what you have meant to us. You baptized us. You taught us the ways of eternal life. You gave us holy communion with the same hand in which you now hold the gun. You also taught us that Christians are sometimes weak and commit terrible sins, but they can be forgiven again. When you regret what you're about to do to us, do not despair like Judas, but repent like Peter. God bless you. And remember that our last thought was not one of indignation against your failure. Everyone passes through hours, hours of darkness. May God reward you for all the good you have done to us. We die with gratitude. They bowed again. The pastor's heart was hardened. He shot the girls. Afterwards, he was shot by the communists. <laughs> I mean, this puts it into perspective, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? Did you see that composure under such distress? Not just about to be shot, about to be shot by their pastor and look at how they maintain their composure and were sustained by the Lord. You may not look at that and say that's joy, but that's joy. 
That's joy. That's that sense of contentedness. We're not bitter against you. We don't harbor anything against you. We die with gratitude. May God bless you. We forgive you. That's the joy of the Christian who's been redeemed by Christ. It doesn't make sense to the world. It makes no sense to the world. But those of us that have been possessed by the living God, we understand it because this earth is not our home. The trials we face don't matter. They knew that once that trigger was pulled, they were in the presence of Christ for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, you think of what Paul the apostle went through. 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 28 gives a whole list of what that apostle endured. He said, so he said, are they Hebrews, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons, more frequently in deaths. Often from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep in journeys often in dangers of waters and dangers of robbers in dangers of my own countrymen in dangers of the Gentiles in dangers in the city in dangers in the wilderness in dangers in the sea in dangers among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Wow. This is Paul. This is what Paul endured for the sake of Christ. And you think of, of, of what he did in his demonstration of joy in all of this. You know, when he was in prison, him and Silas, do you remember in Acts chapter 16, they were beaten, they were thrown in prison. It says in verse 22 of Acts 16, it says, then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Listen. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That's a demonstration of joy. No, their, their soup that they ordered at Denny's was not cold. They were just beaten with rods, and they were put in shackles and were st stuck in a filthy, stinky prison. There were no human rights activists out there, I assure you. The... the uh, Different modern day uh, organizations that defend people in that regard were not out there with them, okay? This was horrible. They didn't get nice clothing and, and, and three square meals that were cooked specifically for them and, and they got to go out in the yard and they had television. This was serious. And in the midst of that, what were they doing? Demonstrating joy by what? Praying and singing hymns and worshiping the Lord. And we know what happened, right? Yeah. That jailer got saved and so did his family as he ran in and said, what must I do to be saved? Friends, that, that is what God does. That is what God does for his people who decide to rejoice in him in the midst of it all. You think of when Paul was shipwrecked in Acts 20. I won't read it all. We don't have time, but, but they're bobbing up and down in the ocean and, and Paul stands up and tells him, hey, you got to take food. You got to, you, you know, you got to pick yourselves up and keep going. And as he broke food, he bread, he ate. It says they were all encouraged in verse 36 of Acts 27. They were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And then we know, of course, they all ended up being saved at the end. You see that in both instances, people are being impacted. People are being touched. Lives are being changed. Why? Because Christians are daring to demonstrate joy. And finally, my third point, the decree of joy, the decree of joy. You know, the definition here of joy, and it's, it's mood really in the Greek, uh, one scholar put it this way, he said, the command is categorical, suggesting the need for a definitive decision to take up a joyful attitude. You see that? It's a definitive decision. Count it all joy. You must decide. This is something you must do. It's an, it's an imperative. It's not, hey, try to be joyful. Maybe uh, take up the option of joy. No, you must choose to be joyful. Listen, this same man, Paul, who wrote these words that we've been listening to, the same one who was singing hymns and, and praying when he was in that Philippian jail, he wrote 
to the Philippians when he was in prison, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He didn't write that from his apostolic ivory tower, right? While he was sitting there uh, chomping on great delicacies, he was writing that from a prison to Philippians. And he was telling them, hey, count it all joy when? Yeah, when you encounter various trials, which means what? Rejoice in the Lord always when? Always. Again, he says, I say rejoice. That's that calling. It is, it is a decree and we must determine to do it. You know, I remember as a, as a new Christian, and as I mentioned earlier, when my mom had passed away, before my mom died, I remember I used to say, if my mom ever died, I would commit suicide. That's how much I loved her, how close I was to her. But once she passed away, as I sat there in the hospital, yes, sad, as I was in the cafeteria after we were told her cancer was stage four, she was terminal. I remember eating my tears with my food as I sat there thinking, God, I'm only 18 years old. I love my mom. How am I going to be motherless at this age? And my, my children in the future will never see her. She'll never be there for, for all the occasions. Of my, I mean, I was devastated. And yet by God's grace, I was able to stand up at her funeral and to share the gospel. I was sustained by a peace that surpassed understanding and a joy that carried me through to where people were puzzled. How? How? It was because of the grace of God and that determination to remember what mattered, to remember the eternal, that this earth is fading. My mom had put her faith in Christ and by God's grace, I knew I would see her again. But whether that was the case or not, God is still worthy of our all and he's good. And we can walk in that contentedness, even in the midst of difficult and painful and unfavorable circumstances. That's why Peter could say the following in First Peter 1, 3 through 9 about this joy that we can walk in. I mean, remember, it's a divine command. It's rooted in the character of God and the blessed hope we have in him, not in circumstances. That's why he could say this. He said, blessed be, in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance and corruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. If this, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And then he goes on to say, you rejoice with joy and expressible and full of glory. In this you rejoice, what? In the knowledge that we have a hope in eternity and we can rejoice with joy and expressible and full of glory. I love what Spurgeon said here about Philippians 4.4, 4, to rejoice in the Lord always. He said, in the first place, this is a very delightful thing. What a gracious God we serve who makes delight to be a duty and who commands us to rejoice. Should we not at once be obedient to such a command as this? It is intended that we should be happy. That is the meaning of the precept, that we should be cheerful. More than that, that we should be thankful. More than that, that we should rejoice. I think this word rejoice is almost a French word. It is not only joy, but it is joy over again. Rejoice. You know, re usually signifies the reduplication of a thing, the taking of it over again. We are to joy, and then we are to rejoy. We are to chew the cud of delight. We are to roll the dainty morsel under our tongue till we get the very essence out of it. God never commanded us to do a thing that would really harm us. And when he bids us rejoice, we may be sure that this is a del as delightful, a delightful as it is safe and as safe as it is delightful. Come, brothers and sisters, I am inviting you now to not, distasteful, not to distasteful duty when in the name of my master I say to you, as Paul said to the Philippians, under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Friends, joy is a part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it's a command for us as believers, and it's rooted in the knowledge of what is true and what is right. And I often think of the hymn that was written by John Newton, that man who wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. He wrote a hymn that was really helpful to me when I was going through a really dark and difficult time as a Christian. And it really gave me perspective on sometimes why it is that we even go through times of difficulty. And it goes like this. I asked the Lord that I might grow in love and faith and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. 
I hoped that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yes, more with his own hand, he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will you pursue your worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied. I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set you free and break your schemes of earthly joy that you may seek your all in me. I break your schemes of earthly joy that you may seek your all in me. And brothers and sisters, that's my question. Are we doing that? I think of the poem that I memorized years ago that says, my life is like a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Sometimes he weaveth sorrow and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reasons why. The dark threads are as needful in a skillful master's hand as the threads of gold and silver and the pattern he has planned. And I love that imagery of a tapestry, right? You see the top side, but you know, the bottom side is what we usually look at with all the jumbled up yarn and doesn't make sense. It's not clear, but God sees the upper and without the, the dark threads, you, you can't get an accentuation of the gold and silver. They bring out the beauty in the entire tapestry and God is sovereign in what he allows. We have to remember that. When I was in high school as a new Christian, I wrote this poem. My life path is a narrow straight with obstacles and trials great my company, a faithful friend, my comfort met at journey's end. My freedom shall be from my flesh, my state of conscience new and fresh, no longer captive to my fears, and he shall wipe away my tears. My destination reached at last, behind me lays my sinful past, before me stands my savior strong, who walked beside me all along. And friends, that's the heart of the gospel that God is with us always, even unto the end of the age, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he is Emmanuel, God with us, and that the king is in residence in our hearts always. I love this testimony by someone who witnessed Christian joy. As a third century man was anticipating death, he penned these last words to a friend. It's a bad, bad world, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. Romans 5.13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, that is the definition, the demonstration, and the decree of joy. I pray that you walk in it by God's grace.